Hello, all you beautiful freaks. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the um, Vampire Love Forever panel here at <laughs> with uh, James and Juliet. My name is Lisa. I'm with Rue Moore Magazine. I'm the resident uh, bumpy file and vampire lover at the magazine. And I'm here to ask them a couple questions and then make sure you guys get an opportunity to ask lots of questions of your own. So thank you both for being here. You've both been at Fan Expo before, but I don't think we've ever had the pleasure of having you together. So feel free to prank each other under the table. <laughs> Um, James, I, I want to start with you and say happy birthday week. Yeah. I know for some gentlemen, 50 is, you know, an event for here, but when you've played someone who's century since years old, it's really not a big deal. Yeah. It's only a number. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really nice to um, it was really nice to, to hang out with fans and get presents. Presents are good. <laughs> the cake is good. Yeah. You get more than one cake? No, but it had my picture all over it. <laughs> I think I've had that cake. My birthday too. <laughs> I was just asked to say if anybody has empty seats near you, put your hands up because they'll filter. There's a lot of people that want to try and still get in, so they'll, they'll fill in. SRO, so Julia. Standing room only. <laughs> Uh, Buffy audition because I understand um, that you busted out Shakespeare, which might have been unexpected. Why, why did you do that? Uh, I was messing with the other actors that were auditioning for the role. I was just, it was psychological warfare. Uh, I, you know, a lot of those actors probably didn't care, but I had come from stage and I was known for doing Shakespeare pretty well. And I was just like, I'm a better actor than all of you. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do Macbeth right in this corner. And they probably just thought I was the same. You know, back on a, I can't tell you. Was that before you came in? Yeah. <laughs> but it like psyched me up, you know, because Macbeth is a bloody role, and I'd just done it in Seattle before I came, and I was probably reminding myself. I was probably nervous for reminding myself if I could actually act. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the people in the room now know that you were not originally destined to be a regular star and character on the show. You were written in for, for one episode. How much do you think the chemistry between um, you and, and Julia's Drusilla character had to do with the fact that you got to come back? It was the only reason I got to come back. I was Juliet's boy toy. Uh, Juliet was the point, and I was, I, was, uh, I was set up. I think the idea was that... Angel and Buffy sleep with each other. Angel goes evil, kills me, and takes up with you, yeah? Oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> I think no one ever told me, but I kind of smelled that that was the original plan. And so I was supposed to die in five to ten episodes. Uh, but instead, they just put me in a wheelchair. But yeah, it was, it was, really, uh, it was really the fact that, that I think that you and I... The thing was that, that we both come from stage and we both uh, care a lot about what we do, and I think that we kind of we kind of um, we kind of hooked in almost instinctually at the audition for that, and then it just rolled on to the point where my girlfriend at the time, you remember Liz? Yeah. She, she was way jealous of you. She, we went over to Julia. You told me that later. I never. She would come over all the time. <laughs> Like, cause there's one point we were watching, we came over to your house to watch one of the episodes, and at one point, I, either you leaned over to me or I leaned over to you just to say, like, oh, that moment worked, right. whatever the thing was, and she kind of, like, like noticed that, <laughs> and then told me later that, like, the next day that she had a crush on David Boreanaz. <laughs> So all the stuff early on with David, I actually hated him. <laughs> That's why that stuff worked so well. It wasn't acting. It took me a long time to know that I just got set up by my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and in fact, David was being really nice to me the whole time. <laughs> so, fool. Julia, what 
what do you remember about your first um, acting scene uh, with James? Was it audition or was it on set? And were you impressed with Shakespeare? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I missed the Shakespeare portion of, of that, but uh, the, that experience. But basically, right from the get go, um, I had been cast, and they wanted they paired me with the final choices, uh, five final choices for Spike. So I guess you were out there doing like that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and then the minute James came in. Um, Really, it, it, we just had, first you came in with a southern accent, yeah. I remember that, yeah. and because your agent had told you of southern, and then Joss was like, well, can you do English, and then he, he switched, and he did, and then right away we just sort of took the scene, and it, the scene that James was reading was the anointed uh, one, that first scene in the School Heart episode, and all this stuff started happening, and we really had that moment where we... Um, we were, instead of talking to the anointed one, we sort of leaned toward each other, our heads rested, and all of a sudden we remembered that we were talking to him, and we turned out. And we were like, afterwards, when you got cast, we were like, that was, that was really cool. Let's, let's put that, in, you know, let's, let's find, where did we do that? And it not only made it into the first episode, but they ended up using it as the promo, um, where they basically would say, Evil has a few new faces, and it was absolutely <laughs> And then turning out to camera, we were like, wow. <laughs> acting like moment to moment like literally working off each other like a tennis match you know or a dance and it really came out of the moment it wasn't any of anything that either of us conceived in our head yeah that's what i remember about, about working with you that's the, that was the things i felt like we were both playing you know like the, in stage they say it's called a play for a reason no one is going to pay money to watch you work you have to play <laughs> and i thought that you know, you understood that, and a lot of actors in Hollywood, they're very serious, and and they, they're, I don't know, they're not having fun, or they complain, or whatever, but you, I mean, we're both very serious about it, but at the same time, we're serious about having fun, and it's all in the moment, yeah, it was, and it becomes like a tennis match. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then there was also, like, the whole, our whole second season, we would get together, basically, and rehearse, and come in really prepared, um, and come in with blocking ideas, which basically means where you're moving in the scenes, and they generally would be like, great. Yeah. <laughs> we come in, and it was it, so that we, by the time we were on set, I mean, we also figured if you're playing characters that have have been together and been familiar for 200 years, you know, we couldn't be shy with each other. <laughs> it interests me. It's funny you say that. It interests me that so few writers and, and directors have gone through and, and presented vampire couples and vampire lovers. We have humans that fall in love with vampires, you know, vampires and sire people, and they have relationships, but there aren't that many great vampire love couples, so you guys get to be at the top of that list pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you really, no one else has really figured out that they should try and unsuit you from that, you know, that it, then when it works, it's, it's something that's pretty special within that genre that is already so sort of overdone, but this is something Quite unique on your show and in all the shows. You don't see that. Yeah, I think that's Joss's mind working on more than one level at one time. Because I mean, he, he his idea was that he wanted the Sid and Nancy of the vampire set. He wanted punk rockers. That was another thing that we kind of we both knew about punk, and we we're both subversive artists. You know, so they actually hired a bunch of actual subversives to play these two punk rockers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and but at the same time. The well, yeah, they were going. To, they, I was supposed to be Sid Vicious, and in my mind, I was like, "You don't want Sid Vicious." <laughs> okay, guys, this is Sid Vicious. Girls like me because I've got a nice figure and a nice. Face. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want. You want Johnny Rotten, man. Johnny I'm not gonna be Sid Vicious. That'd be terrible. I was Sid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for the man face, yeah. 
Todd, Todd was like, this takes 20 minutes, but we're not. We're going to tell him it takes 40. Because if we tell him it takes 20, they'll push us for 15. And I can't do it in 15. It's 40 minutes. <laughs> it was funny. It was a nice conversation. It's like Houdini. Like, you know, like, you know, Houdini would get out of the trap and he'd read a newspaper and tell everyone went crazy. And then it came out. Um, but, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Has your character changed from being a free oh, yeah. bad guy to, you know, well, the, I, as I said to a lot of people online, I really felt like there was a big part of my character that was only on screen if Juliet was on the set. Uh, and that was the real, the punk rock, the drug addict, badass. the subversive badass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I enjoyed playing that the best. Um, the rest of it hurt. <laughs> when, you, when you play any, when, when, when I was playing the other stuff, I was always trying to feel guilty about something or insecure about something, and all of that acting process just sucks. I and mean, when you're there for like 12 to 20 hours trying to feel bad about yourself, <laughs> it's, it's not so much fun just walking around going, I'll kill you all. <laughs> uh, so yeah, being a villain is a lot easier. When you're a villain, you just lurk in the corner, and you just wait for the hero to come by huffing and puffing and feeling guilty about himself, and pop him in the thing, and then you go home. <laughs> Juliet, other than Sid Vicious, <laughs> who were you drawing on, do you think, for Drusilla? Were there other sort of female vampire archetypes that you looked at? I didn't so much look at the uh, archetypes of vampires, but I do remember the first, when I, one, when I was hired and after James was hired, I had a creative meeting with Joss, and we sat down and basically explained the whole vampire lore of the show, and um, I had seen some of the episodes, and we you know, talked about that, and he said what he wanted from Drew, and I remember being really intimidated by the list because he basically, everything he said was sort of contrary. For instance, he said, um, she's very uh, delicate, but she's powerful. She's very childlike, but she's sensual. Um, she's uh, very sweet, but she's diabolical. So I left the meeting, like, everything he said, I was like, I left and I'm like, oh my God. Because <laughs> I've actually never read for the part. I met with Joss, and he'd seen my work in Ed Wood, and I did a movie with Whoopi Goldberg where I played an English character. And so we'd have this creative meeting, and actually when James came in with, for those auditions, all of a sudden I was really nervous, because I was like, and he's going to hate me, hate it, and he's going to fire me, but he didn't, luckily. <laughs> and, but I left that, and I remember thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to do that? And then I started working on the character, and... I always work with a lot of different things. One of the things I like to do is work with visual references, so I pull stuff for each character. I work with music for each character. I just, so I started putting all the ingredients together, and, and slowly this kind of wild, crazy <laughs> lady came out of me. <laughs> you went from being the guy that was supposed to die after one show to, I think it's okay, you don't have to worry about spoilers with you people, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're, you're all, you watch the show, so. Um, you really were the hero at the end. I would disagree with that. No. I think I was the guinea pig. No. <laughs> <laughs> Josh told me that, that, you know, well, you know, you got to be a hero at the end. And I was like, well, you know, I didn't know that I was sacrificing anything. I didn't know that I was going to die. I just wanted the, 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 the pretty necklace, really. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I was kind of like the guinea pig hero. But you have that great line, I just want to see how it ends. Yeah, okay. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's the whole reason why people, you know, keep watching TV and listening to stories, is because they want to know how it ends. And yeah. we'd like to see you come back in comic book form, but not with the two of you as part of the character. Sort of another thing. Except the one I wrote. Awesome. You both, you both yeah. got involved in the creative. So can you tell us a little bit about your um, your relationship with the comic books and, and what plans you may have going forward? Um, I co-wrote two issues of the Angel comic book for IDW. Um, I came up with the storyline and was very involved working with Franco on the art and also um, designed the covers uh, with a number of uh, artists, the alternate covers, and did some of the additional internal art. And, and did all that, and then there are, is plans, but we'll see. I've had to. I've been working on a number of films, and so the schedule is a bit tricky. So we're going to see if we can work out um, a five-issue arc that um, would have to really interesting storylines. So we get to do that. Watch our course.
And me, when I came to town, I had been an um, artistic director of a theater company up in Seattle. And, and when you're an artistic director, you have a lot of power. You get to decide what stories to be told, who's going to tell it, uh, what paint you're going to put on the walls, everything you have, you have control over. And when we come down to Hollywood, you have no control. <laughs> and I was happy about that. Uh, but I also kind of missed being able to pull all the levers. And so I mistakenly thought that if I wrote something, I would have control. Uh, not realizing that in Hollywood, writers have no control either. Uh, so I wrote a comic book, and it was my idea to, to write the most twisted romance between Spike and Drew that I could think of. And try to, try to drive them as far apart as I could think in the very first panel, and then find a way to get them back together in romance. Uh, and handed it over to Dark Horse, and didn't think that I, I needed to to worry about who was going to draw the comic book. Because the comic book was drawn with Spike and Drew looking like this. <laughs> like that. And it looked cool and everything. But see, the thing, the way that the machine works in a romance is that all the guys have to want to be the guy and have to want the girl. And all the women readers have to want to be the girl and want the guy. That's just how the internal combustion of a romance fires its pistons. And they put sand in those pistons, and no one wants to like, like this, you know, so I thought, you know, it was a good comic book, but it would have been a lot better if they would have done what I wrote. <laughs> um, and then, I, I, I actually, I was talking with um, one of the Dark Horse people backstage at Comic-Con this year, and they asked me if I had any other ideas, and I said I actually had an idea uh, uh, that I told Joss, because Joss was there for a little while, there was some plans to do a Spike TV movie, but it didn't go, Aww. didn't pan out. Sorry. Sorry. Um, but it was my idea that Spike, you, uh, I'm talking to Joss, right, and he goes, um, uh, you know, if you want to do a, a TV movie, I'm like, cool, man, do you have any ideas? What do you got? And he goes, I don't really have any ideas, <laughs> but I have, a, I have a line from a movie. <laughs> okay, well, what do you got? And he goes, uh, it's Aragorn in uh, the last, the last uh, uh, in the Lord of the Rings, when he goes, uh, I have no hope for myself, but I have hope for other people or whatever. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, okay, that's really depressing, John. <laughs> that's really self-important. I don't understand where you're going with that at all. And I'm like, oh, uh, well, that's cool. That's good. I have an idea. And he's like, okay, what is it? And I was like, okay, I, would, I always wanted Spike to proactively decide what he wants and go out and get it. We've never seen it. We've seen it. We've seen it. blindly stumble into things, lose things, but I want him to plan to achieve something and then do it. And, but the, the fact that we've never seen him do this before, if he achieves something large, it's going to be cheesy. So it should be something very small. That he can. <laughs> so in my idea, Spike is... Uh, he's poor, he's pretty much homeless, his clothes are falling apart because he's come to a point in his life where he can't mug anybody or kill anybody for food, shelter, or clothing because he's now he's got a soul, but he also is damned if he's going to get a job. <laughs> so he's like walking a dark alley and someone gets in trouble, tries to save them, but he's, his shoes are losing the soles and they're clapping around and so he, he, he has trouble with the fight. You know? his butt kick because his, his clothes are all tattered, right? And, um, and he passes uh, this shop uh, that has this nice pair of punk boots, you know, steel tip, and he just really wants those boots, but he's got no money at all. Uh, and he, he's walking away from the shop, and he remembers that that shop, about 100, 100 years ago, he had pulled a robbery, and they stored the money in, underneath the floorboards of that shop. And so he's trying to figure, so the whole, through the whole story, he's trying to figure out, how do I get that money without hurting anybody, without lying to anybody, being a good person, how do I get that money? And also in the, in the story, there's a big bad comes to town, and he you know, does research, and the big bad doesn't look that big, it doesn't look that bad, and he's like, oh, I'll take that one, yeah, I'm the hero there. And he also meets a woman, and falls in love, and can't tell her that he's a vampire. Doesn't have the courage to tell her who he really is. So he 
And so that, that can play out in comedic ways, like, why can't you come out with me this morning, or whatever. And you just, you know, that can be funny. You're a terrible brunch date. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Don't and, brunch in our future. <laughs> and uh, so when he finally, he finally uh, corners the creature, and then the, when he corners the creature, the creature unfurls to a 20-foot monster. And he ends up running away down the alley. Going, I need a nerd. I need a librarian. I need, I need a witch. Um, the woman sees this happen, sees the fight, realizes that he's a vampire, and dumps him. So he, he, loses, he loses the fight. He loses the girl. But he goes, you know what? I'm just going to go into that shop, and I'm just going to tell them that they have money underneath the floor. It's an old Chinese couple. And I'm just going to tell them, maybe they'll give me a reward. Maybe good deeds have a, have a reward. I don't know, man. I'm going to go. So he goes and tells them. And the, the Chinese lady goes, oh, thank you very much. Now get out. You know? <laughs> and she kicks him out of the thing. And, and uh, he's just walking. This is the very end. He walks down. He's walking down the alley. And the, and the husband comes after him with the boots and says, look, I noticed you like these boots. This old, this we thank you for that. <laughs> so he loses the fight. He loses the girl. But he gets a new pair of boots without hurting anybody, without lying. <laughs> Because you already heard the story. <laughs> Something else. Julia, have you ever gone through that much for a pair of shoes? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you, you're talking about Josh and, uh, Josh, and he has had obviously a tremendous success, um, you know, because of all the hard work that you guys did. Now he's rich and famous. And you can do Shakespeare and much ado about nothing. Yeah. Do you guys talk to him? No. Yeah, not about that. <laughs> but yeah, definitely see Joss and, and, and hang out with him. We, I, but the last time I saw Joss was actually when he was just starting The Avengers. And he was really excited about it, starting production on it. And he was saying that it was really amazing timing because he'd been having a show that was not successful at that moment. And he got this unbelievable opportunity and he was really excited about it. Mm -hmm. I don't talk to Joss at all. <laughs> yeah. You have said in interviews that you auditioned for True Blood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, what happened? It was too short. Uh, I auditioned for that German character, Dieter, and Ball said, that dude is awesome, he's fabulous, but he'd never stacked up in a fight against Skarsgård. <laughs> When I heard that from my manager, I was like, oh, I should have told him I make my money stacking up against tall guys in fights. <laughs> I, did, I did David, for honest, and then I, then I went over to Smallville, and then uh, John and saw him. So I'm used, to, I'm used to mixing it up with tall guys, but okay. <laughs> and then the dude who played him got a bad review, and I was thinking. <laughs> Other vampire characters other than Spike and Yeah, depending on the character. It's an, inter an interesting role is an interesting role. And also, I would think it would have to, for me, I'd like it to be very, very different than Drew, because I don't like doing the same thing. And anything, nothing else really is like Drew. No. <laughs> yeah, uh, me too. Same answer. You know, for a long time, I was like, I can't do any more. Vampires. So I, I, I don't want to get pigeonholed into vampires. But at this point, Julia and I have played other roles. So you can go back and, at this point, I can go back and do a vampire show. The thing about Buffy is it really, to me, happened at a time when genre material started to get taken more seriously. And people have always, you know, there have always been nerds who study Star Trek and, you know. Like me. I mean, that's, that's not new, but people really started investigating <coughs> what Buffy was really saying. That it wasn't just a story about monsters, there was a lot more going on. And I think that's its legacy more than, say, inspiring, you know, any of the other sort of teen vampire stuff that's come in its way. So, thinking back on it, what, what are you both the proudest about in terms of your contribution to the show and its contribution to the society, really? Um, well, I think the contribution, I mean, it's great in terms of there being a female character who's really strong and empowered and in the center of the show is a, is a wonderful thing. Um, and in terms of, you know, it's hard for me to be objective about it 
because of being in it. I just, I just loved the opportunity. I loved just getting to play that role. I had so much fun, and we had so much fun doing it that, you know, that, that was a, a complete joy for me. Yeah, and I agree too. You know, I'm, I remember uh, I was in the back of a car going to one of these conventions with a really well known actor from the Star Wars movies, <laughs> who will remain, remain un, uh, unnamed. Uh, and he's telling me why Buffy's a stupid show. <laughs> why, why a girl that size could never defend herself like that. <laughs> and I remember going to him, uh, dude, I fight the stunt doubles for Buffy, and they're triple black belts. <laughs> I kill both of us without breaking. <laughs> it's all about training, man. And, you know, because he's from a different generation, and, you know, he wasn't getting it. But it was that idea that, a, that it was a story about a female who could solve her own problems on her own. And I think that that was, at the time, kind of revolutionary. I mean, now it's a little more common. Uh, but at that time, it was very new. Um, and the other thing that I, I think, but the reason that Buffy kind of, it will continue to be uh, uh, important, actually, not to get too self-involved about it, <laughs> um, is that it, 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 it's about realizing that the world is a messed up place and still caring about it and not giving up. And how do you not give up on yourself? How do you not give up on the world when you realize that it's, that it's horrible? And in that way, uh, it's kind of like a catcher in the rye, or kind of like a Hamlet. I'm not comparing it to the writing, I'm just getting to the theme, is, is kind of the same thing. I know there are many people here with questions about Buffy. I want to wrap with just a question for each of you about um, other more current projects. Juliet, what can you tell us about where the road runs out? Um, it's a movie I just shot in Africa, and I'm a um, female lead. I play an English missionary, very different sounding than true, though. <laughs> runs an orphanage in West Africa. And then I also just uh, finished The Bronx Bull, which was formerly called Raging Bull 2. And I play a Viennese movie starlet, wild party girl, that has an affair with uh, Jake LaMotta, who's played by William Forsyth. teenage girl that wakes up in a bomb shelter and her next door neighbor that I play is down there with her and, he, and the guy says um, World War III has started, the missiles have been fired uh, I didn't have time to talk to you about this so I just knocked you down and dragged you in <laughs> <laughs> and so she's got to figure out what that, and there's no radio because you know, there's, there's no way to communicate with the outside world, there's no way I, I'm going to let her open the door and she's got to figure out if I'm lying or not when will we see that? Um, sooner rather than later, I would think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool right yeah, Google, Google it up. I'm not really sure what the exact thing is, but we were selling it at Comic Con, so I think it's going to be pretty soon. Yeah. So, I know there are many people here with questions. I will try to get to as many as possible. Please ask one question only. And um, if you could stand up and ask your question so everyone can hear it, that would be great since we don't have mics. I'll start with that gentleman there on his hand up right there. Right, um, I don't remember being asked that. I don't remember being asked that either. Uh, 
definitely Juliet. Both said each other. Both said, you said you did and you said you didn't. Oh, well, ah! yeah. You're wrong. You're wrong. It's you. You're the better. I think it's my English accent. Um, there's a hand there. Go Pat. Yes. Yeah, this is uh, for Juliet mainly. I know there have been a lot of, I'd say, decent play sequences in Buffalo. Apart from where your character talked about Kendra, did you wish that Drusilla had more play sequences? I would have loved to. Having, I was a dancer, so I actually really loved doing a lot of the, the fight choreography and stuff. And, and when James and I got a few times to do stuff, he also gets, he's done so much stage stuff and sword stuff and combat stuff. It, it really is very choreographed and by the numbers, and that stuff is, is really fun. They, they were great in terms of the stunt doubles with me. Um, there was a girl named Michelle and then uh, another gal that, that doubled me who were built like me, which is great, because often they're a little larger than me. <laughs> you know, just like more athletic. And so it was great, because she did double me really well and try to mirror some of Drew had a very specific body language. Um, but I would have I would have really loved to do it. The only thing was in that particular uh, fight sequence, it was funny, because we were shooting the confessional scene where uh, 1882, where David's in the um, confession with Drew, and it's like the you know, first time we had ever seen Drew back back in the day before she was a vampire, back to back with the killing Kendra scene. And so Todd, the makeup artist, said, "Well, we have a little bit of a problem in that we can't have the Drew manicure, which was um, the red with white tips, for 1882, but we need it really clearly when you're slicing her neck. It, it will show." So his solution was to put on these press-on nails, the, like Lee press-on nails. So we were shooting, and I was in four inch heels, and literally as, as Bianca and I were doing the fight, my nails were going boom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and flipping off, so we finally get the nails to stay, to tug it on them. Then we, we were doing this whole part where uh, uh, Bianca's supposed to you know, kick me right about here, and we rehearsed it, and we rehearsed it, and we rehearsed it every time, perfect, perfect. I don't know what happened, but I think the minute they yelled action, she got really excited. <laughs> so the next thing I know, I see this huge combat boot. Like, I'm oh. like, it's not going to get the mark. And I see it come up toward my head and like, boom. Oh. Me in the head. And I'm such a girly girl, but I've never been in a fight. So I was like, oh, you really do see stars. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? What? And meanwhile, I'm like thinking, my head, whole head's going like, wong. And I'm thinking, I don't want to ruin the take, right? So I'm like, I gotta keep going. So the next part of it is I, I grab her by the throat and I back her into the wall before we sort of do the deed. And I remember, I think it's the take that's actually used in, in the episode. I grabbed her by the neck and I made eye contact with her. <laughs> I was looking at her, I was like, Bianca, don't fucking do that. <laughs> Does that answer your question? 
You do. You do find your way to do it. It's much easier when you click in with somebody and you can really go and, you know, that, that, that makes it a joy. Um, it's definitely much more difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but Julia, it was effortless. Sometimes you really have to go home, do homework, and, and really look for that thing that you can love any other person and really be attracted to. And you don't, you don't instinctually have that, but you have to find it because it's your job. Hi, so um, in all seven seasons, whether you're in the scene or not, what would you consider your favorite scene? Favorite scene? In all seven seasons of Buffy. Mm -hmm. You know you're going to get this one. I never hear it. Favorite scene? Usually get favorite yeah. episodes. Yeah, yeah. Like that. I've actually never been asked that. You people from Toronto are all original. <laughs> What's your favorite scene? <laughs> uh, props to the girl at the very end. I felt that a lot of the body was my favorite stuff. I could see that because I, I wasn't in it. I could watch it as a complete audience member. And I wasn't just going, oh, I look good in that shot. Oh. <laughs> um, and so I really could just appreciate it as a human being. And I was really moved by it. So probably a lot of that. I remember. Um, I remember when um, there was a, there, at some point we were up for some like a bunch of awards, and I kept telling Joss, "Look, we're not going to win any of these because you called it Buffy the Vampire. <laughs> if you wanted awards, you should have called it something else. So let's go to the freaking dinner, all right?" <laughs> We were up for some really good award, right? We were up against West Wing. West Wing. And, and we were all at the table, all the writers and me and the other people were all at the table. And the guy is with the envelope, he goes, and the winner is? And we all in chorus, perfectly synchronized, at our table go, West Wing! <laughs> and it was West Wing. <laughs> That's good acting. Todd McIntosh won uh, Emmys for the makeup on Buffy. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're really running out of time. One question, no, a couple questions. If there was a fight between Buffy and Vampire True Blood Vampire, there's a fight between the Vamps on Buffy True Blood and uh, Vampire Diaries. Buffy! <laughs>